Atheist Nomads, episode 343, The Truth About Marriage. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin, and joining me in a little bit will be filmmaker Roger Nygaard. And like I'm going to say at the start, so I guess I probably shouldn't say it now, but... Yeah, he's somebody I've wanted to have on the show for a long time, and uh, finally got him on. I was kind of holding off for him to get this film done, and it's done. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about more about that before we actually get to the interview talking about it. Um, before that, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm definitely liking not having to look at the news as much. Uh, it is definitely good for my my psyche, and has allowed me to. Uh, Kind of go through some cabin fever, which I am definitely feeling. Uh, it's it's tax season. Um, we have a, a, si- a decently sized uh, refund coming up, and that will uh, help fund some uh, a round of of repairs and upgrades to our camper trailer. And I am so ready to get started working on that and get out camping. I am tired of winter. I want to get out. I want to go somewhere where I am disconnected from the outside world, where none of that matters, and I can just unplug and be bored. Yeah, I I want to be bored. I have gotten really bad at, at trying to be bored, but there is, like, that's, like, honestly, that's one of my favorite things about fishing, is the fact that it is just so wonderfully boring. That's still a few months off. I'll get to get started on that, of course, much sooner, but uh, that'll be with the working on the trailer. Um, but getting out and uh, enjoying the outdoors is is still a ways out. Uh, and with this this change in the format, one of the things I, I want to do is is start each episode with the news story that basically got the most, um, I'm going to say, strongest emotional response out of me. Uh, and, and this one is, is a local story. Um, this one is about Boise is a, a refugee city. There's, there's lots of people. Whenever you drive around, you, you will see bumper stickers on cars saying refugees welcome. Uh, we have strong refugee programs. Uh, we have one of the two major health systems here has a, a major, um, global health program specifically geared towards the refugees. We have a lot of stuff around town for refugees. It is it is something that that Boise really prides itself on. But when we talk about refugees, it's not the subject of this news story. And this news story is coming out of WCVB. It's from Boston. And this is about California refugees. Yes. Californian refugees coming to Idaho. Uh, as... One wrote into, yeah, as one wrote into uh, the uh, state government um, as they were considering a change in vaccine rules, strengthening the vaccine rules, wrote, quote, I'm writing as a deeply concerned parent in California refugee who had to pull my entire family out of the state to protect them from tyrannical government. I will not stand by allowing Idaho to become a socialist state. The next one, quote, I am a mother and I am a California refugee. I came here in search of medical freedom. That was Shaley Brindley, a Bay Area native at a hearing at the Idaho State Capitol. Um, Lou Munilla left a, a public comment, got a master's degree from Stanford, but moved to Idaho, quote, for the freedoms of this state, end quote. He told the audience that he would defend his rights, quote, with my life and my weapons. I don't care about the herd. I care about my family, about my children, end quote. These are people who are moving from California to Idaho because California enacted reasonable legislation to prevent stupid people from being stupid, to protect their children, and even more importantly, to protect other children from their children. 
Because when you're talking about herd immunity, you are talking about kids with cancer. You're talking about kids with immunodeficiency disorders. You're talking about kids who just don't respond to vaccines because with most vaccines, anywhere from 5 to 10% of people are non-responders. Okay, usually it's, it's around 5%. Uh, if you get much higher than that, the, the vaccine's not likely to actually be getting approved. Uh, but yeah, about 5% just don't respond. We need high vaccination rates to protect people who just, their bodies don't produce the, the antibodies. And when you look at all those groups of people who legitimately need the herd, that's about 5 to 7% of the population. We need everybody else to get vaccinated to protect them. And herd immunity goes to help not just them, it goes to save babies who can't get vaccinated. Uh, we would definitely had some concerns when Kylie was a, a newborn about the various diseases that were going around then. Uh, we had a active pertussis outbreak in Idaho, a state that continues to have really shitty pertussis outbreaks every fucking year so we were worried about that it was a particularly bad flu year that year so we were concerned about influenza i was watching for measles outbreaks because unless you're at super high risk they don't give kids the mmr until a year old because it's they're not going to respond to it very well and by not respond to it very well i mean not produce very many antibodies but because of the fucking measles outbreak in Vancouver, not only did Kylie get her vaccine on time, which she would have anyway, she got the second vaccine three months later. That normally isn't given out until right before kindergarten. And they have started bumping the second dose up to three months earlier. What that means is that pediatricians are looking at it and classifying basically everyone as being at Pretty high risk because of fucking people like Lou Munilla who would respond to a needle with a fucking gun. I mean, god damn. Ugh. Yeah, okay. I, I'm, I'm a little, this one definitely got to me. People like to talk about how liberal California is and how liberal Californians are. And if you, you talk to people in conservative areas in places like Oregon, you will hear them talk about all the California liberals moving in and ruining their state well it's fucking california conservatives ruining the state that i live in now and yeah they're california on average is a lot more liberal than a place like idaho but with like 35 million californians and about 1.7 million people in idaho if you took just a tiny fraction of the most conservative californians and moved them up here it could totally transform Idaho into even more of a conservative fucking hellhole. Ugh. All right, that is the only news story I'm going to talk about. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and move on to the interview. Uh, before we get to the interview, I, I do want to acknowledge that the language is largely gendered and heteronormative. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that up front. The topic was marriage, and when Roger got into doing his, his research for his, his movie, The Truth About Marriage, he pretty quickly found that for the scope of that film, the differences between gay and straight couples were negligible. But the differences that did exist between gay and straight couples were actually, like if you dig down into that, it's a whole movie by itself. So based on, on who it was he was talking to and the, the researchers that he was, um, and authors that he talked to, uh, yeah, it, it kept pretty standard heteronormative. Um, if that's going to bother you, then you probably shouldn't listen, but I, I, I think it's actually pretty, it's pretty good. And I know that, uh, talking it through with, with Lauren and, you know, we both watched the movie before doing the, before I did the interview, um, it's actually prompted some valuable discussions for us. So I, I do recommend listening to the interview. Um, I, I do recommend watching the movie. It's uh, well worth it. And uh, we'll be back with the interview. All right. And I am now joined by filmmaker Roger Nygaard, 
who just came out with a new film, The Truth About Marriage. This is the follow-up to his film, The Nature of Existence, which came out back before Atheist Nomads was even a thing. Roger, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You are the person who, more than anyone else, uh, I would say, has been on the list to be on the show um, since the beginning, but haven't been on because I've been waiting for your new movie. (laughs) Uh, Well, finally, yeah, here we are. It only took me eight years to get this one done. (laughs) Yeah, because we had this little thing going on, you know, about eight years ago, maybe even pushing nine years ago with, uh, you were on Chariots of Iron quite a few times and I was starting to be on that show several times and... It was kind of neck and neck which one of us was going to be on the show more. And that was, we had some fun back and forth with that. Yeah, I like I like holding records. That that's a good record to have. There's, you know, it's kind of funny how I got to this point, though. I mean, when I finished the Nature of Existence, I would I did film festivals, and people would invariably ask me in a podcast too. They'd say, "Okay, it was great. We loved it. Now, what's next?" <laughs> and I didn't really have, you know, how do you think of what's next? You just gave birth. And the last mm-hmm. thing you want to think about is getting pregnant again. But you got to have an answer. So I was at a film festival at Dallas, USA Film Festival. And just as a joke, I said to the audience, well, I just did a documentary on the very nature of existence itself. So I need something that's even more inexplicable than that. <laughs> and the only thing that might qualify would be marriage. And it got a big laugh. Mm-hmm. And then I started thinking, maybe that is a good idea. Yeah. Well, and you did a really good job of promoting the nature of existence. Like, I I remember uh, I hosted a uh, watch party and then conversation with you over Skype with uh, a local group that's now defunct here in in Boise. Uh, And that was was a lot of fun. It was was really cool having people watching it. And then we all got to chat with you. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, my one of my goals in making my films, all my projects, is that I try to create something that will mess with people's brains a little bit mm-hmm. and and stir them up, and it makes for good conversation when they're everybody's kind of freaked out a little bit by what they just learned or saw or or <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> digested. <laughs> yep, and yeah, and like I would have actually had you on as one of the first few guests on the show, but figured. Most, at least at the early times, most of the listeners would have been coming over from Chariots of Iron, who had already probably gotten sick of you. So <laughs> I, yeah, I yeah, figured, yeah, let's, true. let's give it a little time. You yeah. know, I don't want to be overexposed. Let's wait a year or two until the next film's done. And now eight years later. <laughs> Thank goodness we're still alive. <laughs> but it, it did definitely make sense once, you know, yesterday, uh, my, my wife and I sat down and watched it. And yeah, you had people that... You talk to while they're getting married and then followed up five years later. That takes some time. Yeah, it's like Michael Apted style. Michael Apted has been doing that with his 7-Up, 14-Up, 21-Up films that's been going on for decades. Yeah. It's a, you know, a parallel or just following someone's life. And in this case, for the truth about marriage, what I started out doing is, I, you know, you, everyone gets invited to weddings all the time. And sometimes they're fun. Usually it's just kind of a chore. and You just go and get it over with, just show your support. But I started bringing my camera randomly when I got invited, and I began interviewing the bride and groom, asking them kind of tough questions. And then I banked the footage. I interviewed five separate couples over a few years, and three of them made the final cut when I checked it up on them many years later to see what happened. It was always a surprise what happened to people. Yeah, that really would be. It reminds me, it's like an old Woody Allen joke. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> well, maybe that's an idea for uh, me doing, uh, you know, scheduling guests here and out is go back to some of those early ones and uh, see how they're doing now. And yeah, my wife has told me I need to do that. But yeah, well, it, right. Yeah. yeah. Who, People's who's lives still, uh, like, who, who's, who's not in jail? You know, who's still alive? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what happened to them? Like, there are people who have been guests on this show that are dead. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> They're going to be hard to contact. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, there's... Uh, yeah, that that is... Uh, well, it's bound to happen. Definitely. <laughs> right, yeah, it was just statistics. Um, if you, you go long <laughs> enough... And, like, you interviewed... You know, if you started off with five couples, 
statistically speaking, the odds that one didn't make it would be relatively high, and you did have one of those. Yeah, it's a coin flip, right? You got a 50-50 chance over the, a lifetime, but over five years, you know, it might take some people longer than five years to figure out they made a mistake. But yeah, I had one out of three that were, I, I interviewed them as they were getting divorced. Well, and, and the other two are kind of surprisingly yeah. still together. You're right. Well, and what's kind of funny was looking at it. I, I guess that the one that did it in a divorce when you were talking to them as newlyweds, um, I was guessing they were going to, they were going to be getting a divorce. There was just <laughs> enough things. You could see the writing on the wall. <laughs> well, okay. When you, you, you talk about the statistics, the coin flip, uh, that coin flip is skewed by people who have been divorced prior, getting married again, and then getting divorced again. Uh, That's true. The statistics bear that out. Yeah, the it's 50-50 chance first time marriage. Second time marriage, it drops to 60% chance of divorce. Third time, 70% chance of divorce. So people get worse at it over time. And the explanation for that, the theory is that if you're good at staying marriage, it takes you out of the dating pool or out of the remarriage pool. People getting remarried are ones who failed once already, so they're likely to fail again, or maybe slightly more likely. <laughs> uh, like my stepbrother, who was, let's see, divorced twice by 22. Wow, he is an achiever. Uh, his third divorce was done by, I think, 32. And that was his last divorce. <laughs> Since well, then, if he's he... still alive, I presume he's alive. Yeah. There's plenty of time to, to keep that number, rack up more points on the board. Oh, since then, he just, he, he decided that he's going to be, try and be more ethical about not being monogamous. And I think honesty he's been a lot happier. Front. Yeah, honesty up front. That's a really good policy. It's better to take your lumps up front. Because the longer you, you wait, to be honest, the, the, the lumps get bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, okay. So walk, well, you know, because most of our listeners at this point haven't heard or haven't watched the, the movie yet. Uh, hopefully they, they will after listening to this, but walk us through the basic uh, premise and, and flow of the movie. I started out wondering why I'm such a, a, a freaking failure at relationships. You know, my documentaries often tend to be a, a personal catharsis or a journey, an obsession of my own, my own problem and trying to figure it out. I become the investigator with uh, a mystery that I'm going to go solve. You know, in the nature of existence, the mystery was, why do we exist? You know, what's our purpose? Which is what led me into the, the realm of religions and atheism and exploring that whole concept and coming to a, an acceptance and answer uh, a, a place for me where I was happy with what I discovered. This time, my core question is, or was, why is marriage, or relationships, why, why is marriage so hard for people? It's it just, if something was natural, you wouldn't have to work so hard at it. So clearly there's something wrong. I mean, what if, if I was selling you a product, you came to me, I'm a salesman, I'm, I'm a car salesman. You walk into my dealership and I, you'd say, hey, what, how is the product here? How are these cars? Well, if I said to you, these, these are awesome. Everybody loves them. Everybody's getting one. You got to get one. You're going to love it. It's going to make you happy. It's going to fulfill all your dreams. And then if you said, well, it sounds wonderful. I really, I, I should get it. Uh, is there any guarantee? And my answer was, nope, no guarantee. And half of them break. And the other half that don't break are going to take a lot of hard work to keep them going. You'd say you better go back to the drawing board because there's something wrong with your product. Although if you look at cars nobody's nobody's gonna hang on to a car that long there's another problem right <laughs> if, if i said okay you get to have one car for your whole life you get to have one food for your whole life and, and, and you'd go what but if i say you get you only get to have one woman for your whole life you're supposed to go that sounds great there's a disconnect right there's something wrong here well, and so I focused yeah. on it from my perspective and tried to figure out, okay, there's a problem. Let me solve the problem. And then that's the first half of the documentary. The second half of the documentary was me trying to coalesce as long as we're now that we know why we're here, what do we do about it? What are some simple solutions that anyone can do to improve their relationships? You don't have to do it, but only if, if you want to be happier. All right. And how did you pick the 
the uh, subject matter experts that you talk to? When I started out, it's, uh, for any of my concept documentaries, it's kind of the same process. I'm obsessed with a topic, so I get a copy of every book on the subject. And I, I had a stack of books five feet high, and I started reading and taking notes, writing my questions, finding data and research, and I made a list of all of these authors and scientists and researchers, anthropologists, psychologists, marriage counselors, divorce attorneys who had written books. And I got a big map, put it on the wall, put a push pin where they lived, and I started to see where they clustered. Then I contacted everybody, sent out emails, and whoever responded and said yes, and I would plan a trip. Okay, these are the East Coast clustered people, and here's the Pacific Northwest. Here's England. There was a guy in Spain. And then I just, it took me several years to track them all down and collect footage. But that was how I would begin the the process of collecting the the raw footage. But if there was just one in, say, Louisiana, that would be less likely to actually merit a trip. Yeah, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Yeah. Right? What's If I'm going to spend the time and energy, but if it's somebody really, like there was this guy named Dr. Robin Baker who was in southern Spain. There was no one near him, but I really wanted that guy. He wrote a book called Sperm Wars, and the book was so mind-blowing to me when I read it. It answered a lot of questions and raised a lot of questions, and it was very controversial when it came out because just in short, he and his partner, uh, they discovered that men's sperm is all different. There isn't just one kind of sperm when a man has an ejaculation. There's, there's, they're all shaped differently. There's pointy-headed ones, double-headed ones, coil tail, straight tail, short mid-piece, long mid-piece, all these different types of sperm. And then the next question is, why is that? And what they discovered when they mixed the sperm of two men's ejaculate together, the sperm would attack each other. Huh. And it was like two armies going to battle. So they, what the theory that they came out or that came from that was that women promote sperm wars within their bodies by collecting sperm from multiple donors because it's better because in that way, only the best sperm will fertilize an egg. And what's controversial about that is that it, it, it says it implies that promiscuity is natural. And maybe it was at one time. And so that's in his book, he, tr- he explains all of the sexual behaviors or many of them that people experience from group sex to homosexuality to regular vanilla sex, whatever. And why we do it, why it happens, and why it's beneficial or adaptive or not adaptive. Uh, it, it takes all these behaviors that we might think of as extreme or, or normal and explains why we do them. Okay. Well, and, and that actually, that hypothesis on, on sperm battling, that would help explain why humans have such low uh, sperm viability. like. It explains a lot of things. He said if if, yeah. if there wasn't sperm warfare, we wouldn't have the, the same – our culture would be different. We wouldn't have the arts that we have. We wouldn't have orgasms. We wouldn't have – the penis wouldn't be shaped the way it's shaped. Everything that, that we take for granted or assume is – I mean, why is it, right? It, there's a reason for everything. Right. And, and like chimpanzees the, the have – like with a chimpanzee, ninety nine percent of the sperm, or or ninety eight percent, or something like that, are are capable of actually fertilizing an egg, compared to like yeah, but twenty two percent right. in humans. Yeah, one uh, percent of the sperm will fertilize an egg is a very small percentage. Yeah, hmm. that is that is fascinating. And ch- chimpanzees and bonobos share a common ancestor with humans, and so it's easy to draw a lot of parallels in behavior with humans. But what they don't have is a the evolution of our culture. Our culture is what's changed right. radically. And that was part of what I discovered why humans or why marriage is so difficult for people is, is because what we were doing 100,000 years ago is culturally is so vastly different from the way our culture is now that our culture be, asks us to behave in ways that are out of sync with who we are as a species. So everybody's frustrated 
trying to reach these ideals that are virtually unreachable. Well, that that applies to basically everything in modern life. In our culture, yeah. I mean, living in a house is unnatural. Driving a car is unnatural. Sitting at a but computer. But we adapt to it. Sitting, yeah. sitting all day we're, working on stuff is... Our backs we're highly adapted. Yeah, our backs aren't adapted to that. <laughs> but we pay a price. Yeah, we have. there are problems or side effects to these uh, adaptations. And it's no different in relationships. All right. Uh, so then, and, and you definitely did cover, you know, both the the people who are trying to look at the the biology and the uh, evolutionary psychology sides of it, and the people that are dealing with how it works in today's culture. Uh, did you find a conflict between those groups, or or did it all just? Did you think it all flowed well naturally? The, uh, the the comparison you mean between biology and culture? Well, the, the, between like the, the viewpoints of the, the, the biological, you know, like the biologists versus the viewpoints of the uh, public speakers and therapists and the like that you had. Yo, well, there's a lot of uh, synchronicity between all the scientists because the psychologists and the evolutionists are generally on the same page. Where there is a disconnect is between the scientists and the religious-based marital theories. Okay. Because they have a different background or different basis for what they believe. And you did have a rabbi. And yes, yes. The rabbi comes from a spiritual perspective, as you would imagine. And the rabbi believes that love and marriage is the joining of two souls. And the scientists, of course, don't speak in terms of souls. And in fact, many of them, the, especially the marriage therapists, find the idea of a soulmate to be harmful to people. Right. If, you're, if you're thinking in terms that there's a soulmate out there for you, if you're not finding it, it's very, very frustrating, mm -hmm. <laughs> to say the least. Where is my soulmate? And from a logical perspective, it makes no sense, because what if your soulmate is born in Cleveland or in Rio de Janeiro? <laughs> or uh, in, Sp in Spain, and you, you, how are your paths going to cross if there's 8 billion people? Right. It's very unlikely, statistically. So it doesn't really make any sense. It's, it's really more of a wishful thinking idea. That's a romantic idea. But what the, the marriage therapist suggests is that instead of uh, looking at soulmates as someone that you have to seek, or that there's some entity creating this uh, orchestrating chess is like uh, or pieces like chess pieces on a on a board that are going to somehow accidentally you know, bump into each other think about meeting when you meet somebody making each other into soulmates over time mm -hmm. through shared experiences and it's a healthier way to look at it yeah you know, dan savage uh, puts it as uh you find you, you you can find happiness when you give up on trying to find the perfect 10 and you find the you know 8.3 that you can round up to 10. Eight, yeah, getting an 8 is a pretty good deal. Yeah. <laughs> or even a, a 7 or a 6 and then round up to, to, to 10. Right. Well, the, the secret to happiness, which I'm agreeing with him, is, according to the experts, that is acceptance. First of yourself, who you are and, and what you are as a species, what it is you desire, what you want, what you need, understanding yourself and accepting yourself. And secondly, accepting your partner for who they are. The Gottmans, John Gottman and Julie Schwartz Gottman, they told me that the statistic that 69% of all relationship problems are never solved. They're just accepted, identified, understood, accepted, and you move on. You can't change. No one's going to change into something else. You can't make someone change into something else. Mm -hmm. What you, what, they might change behavior. You might, they might stop doing something because they know it makes you mad. But if it's the type of thing that's in, really inherent in who they are, they're going to be resentful and over time frustrated and eventually angry, and it's going to come out in another way, trying to be something they're not. There's a polyamorous couple in my documentary that I met who live in Eugene, Oregon, and I found them to be a really high-functioning couple. And it's not because they're polyamorous. It's because in order to be polyamorous, you have to be open and honest about who you are from the beginning. So you know who you're getting. There's no surprises. And right. that was 
one of the what the uh, all the experts agreed that one of the ways to improve longevity and happiness in a relationship is for a couple that's considering marriage to get premarital counseling because in that way they get to uh, to understand each other and learn what are the rules of this game what are the rules of this relationship before you get into it a lot of religious couples do better than non-religious couples and not because of the religion but because the religion forces them to do counseling before they get married. Mm -hmm. That's one of the main things that anyone can do or, and should do to improve their chances. Now from, from the, the, the religious background that I have, uh, I, I definitely found that a lot of pastors required, uh, premarital counseling. Most of those pastors had absolutely no educational background qualifying them to do premarital counseling. And most of the people getting married were doing it because they couldn't, they were tired of waiting to have sex or guilty because they'd already been having sex. That's not necessarily a good recipe <laughs> to start. No, you want someone who knows what they're talking about because they have experience in what they're advising you, ideally. But even if they don't, just the fact that they get two people together to talk about their goals, mm -hmm. what are their mutual goals? In making this film, The Truth About Marriage, I also wrote a book to go with it, a companion book, the same name, The Truth About Marriage. And at the end of the book, I put a, pr a personal priority statement that I created based on my discussions with some of these experts and the divorce attorney I spoke with, Lawrence Bloom. He suggested, he suggested that couples do a financial disclosure and a personal priorities disclosure before they get married. A financial disclosure is something you're going to have to do at a divorce or mm -hmm. in a, if you create a prenuptial agreement. But even if, if you want, if you love somebody and you're, you're planning to share your life with them, it, it actually could be exciting to share everything you know about yourself, including your, your financial background. But it's also good to know what you're buying. What are you getting here? Because you are going to get half ownership of your partner's assets, but also their debts. And so are you willing to bail your partner's debts out? And it's something they should discuss. Right. Then you also get just the differences in, in state laws that apply to when joint ownership of things uh, come into effect, uh, including things like debt and assets. Yeah. Yeah, there's different kinds of property, community property and communal property, and each state has a little, may have a different definition. And like I know Oregon or Washington and Idaho are very similar uh, because they were once the same territory, uh, but they... The, the laws end up working out to where you have, like, by seven years, like, there's this gradual um, creation of community property. So on the day you get married, that doesn't exist. It only applies to what you buy after the marriage date. But by seven years... Which is logical. Right. But yeah. then after seven years, then it's basically full community property on everything. Right. And one thing people don't consider, they might say, well, neither one of us has a lot of money. But... Even if that's not true, if that's true, you don't have much in the way of property or money. Maybe you have good credit, and that's va valuable. Uh, my composer, Billy Sullivan, and co-producer on this film, he's been married twice. And the first time he got married, he married someone who had bad credit, and she destroyed his credit. You know, not a, I'm not saying she was a bad person, but mm -hmm. some people just have a different point of view on how to treat credit and right. charging things. <laughs> or paying for them now or later. And if you don't, if you're not in sync with your partner in that regard, your credit can get destroyed also. Right. Because by the time you buy a house, uh, depending on the bank, it's either an average of your credits or the worst credit out of the couple. You're going to be wishing that you'd run a credit check and a background <laughs> check on this person that you were in love with at the time. You know, when you fall in love, the brain does a, a, a lot of things that, that bring free will into question. One of the things is that it shuts down your critical thinking. The frontal lobe, it deactivates some things that you might, you might normally uh, be a little bit more cautious about. No, I love this person, and so it kind of shuts down. Because Mother Nature wants you together, wants you to reproduce. Mm -hmm. For the next, spend the next two or three, maybe three or four, five, six, seven years together. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy to see some of those, uh, the way events can like 
reminders of your mortality can really amp up the biological clock, so to say. Uh, like the number of people who join the military and get married right before deploying uh, is insanely high. The and, and like when uh, when my father died, uh, Lauren and I had been tra- planning on on waiting a few years to have a kid and decided to not wait at that point. Uh, the reality yeah, something uh, happens. The reality of mortality it, was very present. <laughs> it changes. It flips the switch in your brain. There's another statistic that uh, I came upon that a lot of marriage proposals come after a separation or during a separation particularly when the guy is away from the, this person he's in love with, because being in love is a, it's a physical addiction. There is a chemical addiction that's going on. You get a chemical burst of dopamine, norepinephrine, and oxytocin from being around your partner, having sex, holding hands, hugging, just smelling them. You get this constant renewal, this constant hit of these chemicals you're addicted to. Now, you go on a business trip for two weeks, you go through withdrawal, which is painful, and it makes you crazy, and you start lovesickness, they call it, mm-hmm. right? And then you think, i got to make sure I never lose this person, and you're not realizing that it's because you're addicted to a drug. You just think, you know, it's, <laughs> the love is so strong that you got to take action. And I can think of uh, some friends that did that. <laughs> yeah, free will, right? You yeah. know, we are designed to behave in certain ways. There are programs running in the brain. And uh, we, the, the best thing that, that anyone can do is to learn about yourself, learn about what you are, who you are as a species, what, what motivates you. Just become aware, some more self-aware. Both partners should become more self-aware, I think. And then you can make better decisions about yourself and, and your partner and your future. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and the more you know about the... The algorithms that are at work in your brain, the uh, the better you can handle them. And be prepared for them and know that you go through cycles. This too shall pass. Men go through cycles. Women go through cycles. Humans do. There's a lot of uh, one of the another mind blowing thing that I learned from Chris Ryan, who wrote the book Sex at Dawn, is that the birth control pill has affected people's relationships radically in unexpected ways because when a woman is taking a birth control pill or is on birth control, it, it tells the body, it makes her body think she's pregnant all the time. And that way she won't ovulate and or, and, and egg won't implant and she won't mm-hmm. be fertile. When a woman is pregnant, she is attracted to a different kind of man than when she's fertile, when she's ovulating. So if a woman stays on the pill, she'll stay attracted to a certain type of man, a more nurturing man who will stay at home and help raise the children as opposed to maybe a more, the bad boy, you know, the, the guitar player, the, the uh, a little more wilder sort of uh, person that she might be attracted to when she's ovulating or fertile. And as a result, some, a lot of times couples will they'll be on the pill, they'll get married, and then they decide we want to have children. So she goes off the pill, and they start you know working on try, you know trying to have a child, and then suddenly she's not attracted to him anymore, and they think well it's because we're you know, we've been together too long, we're both really tired, we've been working a lot, or we've fallen out of love, and no, you were they were just attracted to something different, and so what what uh, Christopher Ryan recommends is that couples should go off the pill for a year before they decide to get married. I wonder how many marriages that would end up prompting. <laughs> with, certainly it could affect them either, with, direct, with either, uh, either direction. Yeah. But just with the, the, the increased chance of uh, accidental pregnancies in those years. <laughs> right. Well, you know, and then pregnancy changes the algorithms. Mm-hmm. And it makes people think differently and feel differently because now you've you've got... Uh, 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 this new entity that forces you to love it. Mother Nature has designed it that way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where babies give off pheromones. If you sm- smell a baby's head, you love that baby. You feel protective toward it. it it's such a strong drug, which makes sense, right? Because a baby, for a baby to survive, it needs you to love it and care about it. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then uh, Lauren just wanted me to point out that, yeah, and then most women do go back on on birth control 
after having a kid. Yeah, it, well, it, it also, if a woman, it doesn't matter. Part of what's going on there is that a woman, when she's off birth control, she's a, she's, her body, is a, passion is two bodies recognizing that they're a good match chemically and particularly on what they call the M- MHC, Major Histocompatibility Complex which is the spectrum of the different types of immune systems that human beings can have. There's a couple hundred or a hundred or so different combinations. And if hmm. you meet someone who has an immune system that's identical to yours, you will feel nothing. You may, you might, you know, maybe you'll kiss and go, there's no spark. You meet, if you meet somebody whose immune system is the opposite of yours or further down, further away on the other side of the spectrum, you're a much better chemical match. And they discovered this because there was something called the T-shirt study. A a psychologist in Germany named Klaus Wedekind took 40 T-shirts, had men wear them, the T-shirts for a week without showering, then took another 40 women and had them smell the T-shirts, every single one, and rank them according to how attractive it smelled. And then when they compared their rankings with each of their immune systems and the immune systems of the men, they found this correlation. The more dissimilar their immune systems, the more attractive, how more powerfully attractive they ranked the T-shirt. That is just a bizarre so, study. <laughs> that's one thing that's going on when a woman is not on birth control. Her body is attuned to sensing a good match. And so she's attracted to a good match. If she's pregnant, she can no longer get pregnant so it doesn't matter anymore if they're a good match. What matters is, is he a good, protective, nurturing person who will stay and help her raise this child? So the, the criteria changes. Yeah. But what, like the, the T-shirt study, is, that's, that's a sample size of, of 40. Well, right. 40 I, on, I, on I each side. Replicated since. I believe it's been replicated since. In any good study, anyone should be able to replicate it. Uh. But yeah, that's that's it's an interesting uh, uh, correlation that that does point out a an interesting hypothesis. There's another similar study where at a strip club, the uh, some social psychologists asked the strippers to keep track of their tips hourly over a month, and then they took that and put it on a chart and compared it to their natural menstrual uh, cycle and the tips that they received from men spiked to the highest level when they were ovulating and dropped to the lowest level and stayed consistent when they were having their period. Hmm. Somehow men knew when they were the most fertile. Wow. And were throwing more money at them, <laughs> were more excited by them at that point. Wow. So that's, what, that's you know, there's, weird. there's a good takeaway <laughs> here. You know, they have apps that women can get to put uh-huh. on their phones to track their cycle. So if you if if a woman wants to know when to get pregnant, you, the app will tell you the best time because you're the most fertile, you're ovulating here. But it's also the best time to get what you want from your spouse or ask for a raise <laughs> or manipulate somebody huh. because they're going to be more attuned or more affected by your biological rhythm. That's that's fascinating. Uh, now, you... The, 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 the film was largely heteronormative and i'm sure that's just based on the the sample size of the the books that you had available um but you did have a a lesbian couple that you you interviewed how did they compare with all of that i started to go down the path of doing a whole gay marriage aspect in the documentary and i i didn't do that for two reasons one is that i realized that it doesn't matter gay or straight or otherwise that's not what it's about what what works in relationships is masculine and feminine. And so a gay couple, what works is that there's a masculine partner and a feminine partner. Same, same thing with a, a, a straight couple. One is primarily masculine, one is primarily feminine. And it can be the man is the primarily feminine, and which is the case in maybe 20% of, of the cases. But generally, we, we all you know, understand or accept that men are, on average, generally more mas- the more masculine, of course. So it doesn't really matter. They, gay couples and straight couples kind of want the same things at a basic level and interact 
and 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 follow these same patterns generally. So you found that the distinctions vanished the more you looked at it. Yeah, well, yes, because people are people, and it wasn't about sexuality; it was about masculine and feminine energy. Uh, but the second reason is that there are really fascinating differences about gay marriage. And it really deserves its own documentary. And so if you were going to ask me at the end of this, this interview, what are you doing next? It might, I might answer maybe the truth about gay marriage. All right. Uh, yeah. Like, like one thing I, I, I learned recently on the topic was that it wasn't much of a, a, a thought prior to about the 1980s because the way the laws were, uh, it logistically wouldn't have made sense considering that like married women did not have credit. Only married men had credit and married women didn't own property. It was the man that owned the property. It was illegal for women to own property until very recently. And a lot of that changed. Yeah. Very, very recently. Uh, and it's shocking to think that, that, that some of that, um, didn't go away until the eighties. Yeah. Some things still haven't gone away. I think there's, a. Uh, uh... Something like six states still outlaw sex outside of marriage. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I live in one. Yeah, well, they're not. Uh, it's not enforceable. Arresting but, a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it is on the books, though. Yeah. One of the historians I interviewed wrote a book called uh, "A History of Sex," and he studied laws and mores, and he found that cultures and societies the ruling structure, whether it was the church or otherwise, they tried to enforce rules with respect to sexual behavior because what they're really trying to do is control poor people and prevent poor people from having children because the rich people were afraid they'd have to end up paying for all of these indigent children. And Hmm. so that's the basis, the origin of a lot of these rules is the control, it's money, it comes down to money. Who's going to pay for all these children? Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, and then there was even just like in, in certain times in, in history, marriage was only a concern if you actually had property to need heirs for. And if you were a yeah, peasant who was never going to have property, why bother? Correct. And like with the Catholic Church, for a long time, they didn't have wedding ceremonies or vows And it was just, if two people said, we're living together, we consider ourselves married, then the church considered them married. No ceremony. They just happened to, they decided. Mm -hmm. It's a, this whole, this, this gigantic wedding industry is a, a new phenomenon in human history. And also we have to kind of put things in perspective. It's when people think about traditional marriage, what usually comes to mind is the 1950s, maybe into the early 60s, as this traditional time. But if you, that's a decade, maybe 15 years. Mm-hmm. That's a tiny, <laughs> tiny slice in human history. Humans have been around for 200,000 years yeah. as a species. So what we've been doing for the vast majority of that time is more natural than what happened for this one decade period of time. And... When things changed is about six to 10,000 years ago. Prior to that, humans lived as nomads in small tribes or bands of 150 or fewer where they shared everything, whether it was mm-hmm. food, shelter, sex, child rearing. There was no propriety. Nobody owned anything except what they could carry because they're constantly on the move. Right. And every, there was no, if someone was uh, withheld sex from, from the tribe, they would be considered antisocial and be ostracized. It wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't, nobody considered sex to be a big deal or something to uh, get all worked up about like we do now. Now, one thing when you're, when you're dealing with prehistory is uh, there, there's a lot of, of assumptions that go into making bold claims like that. Uh, so where are they basing that? That's an excellent question, right? We weren't, we weren't there. How do we know for sure? And you, you're right, we can't know for sure because this happened before any of us living was alive to see it. So the theory is first someone, an anthropologist makes a theory Mm -hmm. based on observations or maybe archaeological uh, observations and data. And then they look for existing tribes that might still exist with those behaviors because there are many groups of people in the last 
50 to 100 years that have been studied that have lived the same way for millennia. And they found a tri tribes, multiple tribes in South America, in Mongolia, in different parts of the world that were still living this way. And so it bears out the, the theory. It, it's some evidence that shows that uh, th this theory has some weight. All right. And then, yeah, and if you, you look at the different migration periods and across that much territory. Okay. I guess that, 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 that kind of makes sense. Really, uh, where the, the big change happened six to 10,000 years ago because humans discovered the idea of agriculture. Mm -hmm. That's the big dividing line in human history. Up until then, they're nomads, and now suddenly they can stay in one place and grow their own crops. They don't need to go anywhere. And the idea occurs to people that, well, this is my property. I live here, and these are my domesticated animals. These are my crops, and this is my wife. This is, I, I own all this. Propriety is a new concept. Now, now that you own all these things, now that you understand propriety, the idea begins to occur, well, I want to make sure that all of the things I own go are left or inherited by my own genetic offspring. So you have to make sure that your offspring is your genetics. Now, a woman is, she knows because it comes out of her body. There's no mm -hmm. doubt it's her baby. A man can't be certain unless he's practiced what they call mate guarding, which you see in the <laughs> wild. Right, yeah. Where, but if he's off working in the field, planting, or he's out hunting, or both, he's away quite a bit. How can he be sure that it's his child? And so the idea of marriage began to occur. And it's a way to create a social fence around women and to try to control women's sexual behavior. Not men's, because men can't get pregnant. Only women can. And so if you look at religious texts, like the Bible, the Torah, for example, mm -hmm. you'll see that adultery is a sin, but it's only really a sin for women, not for men. Right. Yeah, and we have the, the disadvantage that uh, the Torah, Bible, and Quran were all written in a very geographically small area. True. They're all, yeah, branches of the same tree. By very similar cultures, yeah. <laughs> but you'll find this uh, pervasively uh, across human culture, oh, yeah. this idea of um, virginity and um, trying to prevent women or to control women's sexuality. Yeah. Uh, ancient Rome definitely had some of those concepts as well. Uh, ancient Greece did too. And this is only, of course, you know, after agri discovery of agriculture at most 10,000 years ago. So if, if humans have been around for 200,000 years, that's only the most recent 10% of human history has marriage as we know it, than a concept. So the vast majority, 90% of human history, we existed without it in much yeah. more of a communal environment where uh, everybody shared. Yeah, of course, we've changed a lot in those 10,000 years. Our culture has, absolutely. We're still the same as we were. If you took a baby today and swapped it with a baby from 100,000 years ago, they'd be identical in terms of, of their potential. Largely so, um, but would have still have a lot of, of uh, distinctions, uh, particularly with uh, climate, disease, and diet. And those are just the easy That's ones to point. identify. True, that different immune immunities and things have, have been necessary once we domesticated animals and lived in crowded environments and mm -hmm. in uh, a high population density. But as far as their instincts, and intelligence, uh, et cetera, there would be virtually no difference. Yeah. Right. It'd be minuscule differences, if even that. Yeah. But yeah, the, our cultures are rapidly changing constantly uh, as our technology changes. And that's why we're uh, continually having to adapt and feeling frustrated and trying to find. And that's why, why monogamy is the rule. Monogamy came about because what came after tribal sharing naturally was polygamy as mm -hmm. some uh, men generally became more wealthy than others acquired more land more resources more allies and therefore they could take for themselves more wives and concubines we had, you know you had kings and pharaohs and sultans with 
you know, a thousand or five thousand sometimes wives and or, or mostly concubines, usually a small number of special wives. But when you've got someone who's got five thousand women all to himself, that means you've got five thousand young men with no women, mm-hmm. which creates some uh, very frustrated young men, and it's not good for society. It makes society very unstable. And so at, at some point, even the king began to realize it's better for me if my kingdom is stable. So the new rule is one man, one wife for everybody, including the king. And that's where monogamy came from. So all of the uh, multiple sexual partners had to go underground. Which, if, and if you look at like uh, ancient Rome and uh, Greece were largely monogamous while the Levant and Middle East were largely polygamous. Yes, and even that monogamous environment was probably more socially monogamous than actually monogamous. But they were also much more peaceful in those time periods. It was pretty peaceful, stable societies until the Persians and uh, Carthage uh, started messing with them. (laughs) Yes. Uh, But but that that kind of does hold hold that the, the more monogamous societies were more stable. And right, because everybody gets stable. some. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's got an opportunity to get some. And and if it's not enough, they get something else on the side. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if they've got a lot of money. <laughs> yes, and yeah, and can pay to clean up the mess. Yeah. All right. Uh, there there was a little bit that, that you touched on with uh, how some of the, the, the modern issues that couples are dealing with weren't problems 100 years ago. Uh, and you talked to your, you even had, uh, talked to your grandma some. Yes. I interviewed her that. when she was a hundred years old. Uh, so what, what would you say was, is kind of the, some of the big changes that have made things more difficult or, or made things easier? Well, I, I did ask my, my grandmother about love. If she, when she married my grandfather, why, well, first of all, why did she get married? I asked her and she said, well, that's what people did back then. She was, when she was 17, I think, 17 or 18, there was a knock at the door one day, and there was a guy at the door that no one in her family had met before, and he said, my name's Carlton Nygaard, and I'm here to marry your daughter. And uh, she said, and then he joined the family. And it, it, I said, did you ever talk about love? She said, no, we never talked about that. Compatibility is far more important. You could be in love with somebody, and if you find out if he doesn't wash his feet, when you're in bed, it's never going to work out. <laughs> this whole idea of marriage for love is a new invention. It's about 160 years old, according to the historians. This idea that humans are special. I have a birthday. My happiness is important. I am unique and special, and I deserve happiness. That's a brand new idea in human history. Several hundred years ago, it was, I need to survive Mm-hmm. And that was the end of the list. What do I have to do to survive? What's the best solution? And the vast majority and of people it, it, just want to make sure they didn't get, didn't get killed by the Lord ruling over them. You need allies. You need to be have be in someone's good favor. You need to win battles if there are conflict. And you're better. You can survive better when you have a partner. Yeah. So that's one brand new idea. This idea of love. And so no wonder people get kind of concerned when this intense feeling that that is natural at the beginning of a relationship starts to wane over time which in my in the documentary i ask people how many times is normal to have sex per week and the married couples all were generally around once maybe twice a week some were once a year but when i said all right what about when you were first dating and they all said once or twice or up to five times a day when you, you're in that in, initial really passionate excitement. Everyone agrees it drops off. The passion drops off because passion turns to compassion because you have to switch to child rearing. And then people start to miss the passion or they think that something's wrong. Or and, But we're not designed to, to have continual passion. We're designed to... Uh, Passion is designed to close distance between two mm-hmm. good compatible uh, chemical matches, good genetic mates, and then 
you're designed to uh, seek a new mate. Or uh, if you, like in the old days when everyone lived in a tribe and everyone was mating with everybody, anyone, any child could be, belong to anybody. Everyone's working to raise the children together. It was a, it was a cooperative venture. And women didn't have to worry that if their husband died, that they'd be destitute or wouldn't be able to take care of themselves. The tribe takes care of everybody. So there was much more cohesion and less anxiety. And, and uh, Christopher Ryan, who wrote Sex at Dawn, his new book is called Civilized to Death. And his thesis <laughs> in that book is how we think that we've got this utopia, but his argument is that if the yardstick is how happy are we, we've got things much worse now because hunter-gatherers worked fewer hours, had better health, had a better social environment than we do now because we're all working more hours, we're more anxious, we eat worse, our diet is worse, we have all these diseases that were unheard of in uh, nomadic cultures. Yeah, but the and nomadic cultures had their own diseases. Far fewer. And were more, far more likely to starve. Uh, the, the, the starving thing is a concern, but it's actually better for human beings to have uh, lean times. Your body is designed to go through some lean times. And but there are longevity studies that there, show a, that but you do big, better. To, but there's a really big difference between having a complex agricultural society dealing with a famine where it gets lean and a nomadic tribe who has nothing and they all starve to that death. That isn't how, generally how it worked because in this complex society, they would put all of their eggs in one basket or all of their seeds on three crops. And if they failed, they had nothing to fall back on. Whereas hunter-gatherers had hundreds of options for things to eat. And if something was lean one year, they had plenty of other things in abundance that they could switch to because they ate such a wide variety of things. In some cases, uh, there, there definitely were cases that, that didn't have, have a lot of variety. Uh, desert nomads and Arctic nomads, for sure. Um, very low uh, variety. Well, that was the beauty of nomads. If they're if it's lean, you move on. So you find places which with a, of a, with abundance. It's hard to imagine what it was like a hundred thousand years ago when there was only maybe a hundred million humans scattered throughout the globe. Yeah, but billions. But I I, I really think that. Uh... That your friend there has way too rosy of a view of the, the past. The reason the population was pretty static at around 100 million humans was because the natural environment couldn't support more. So if the population went up, people would starve and there'd be fewer people. You're not wrong that the carrying capacity of the planet is probably 200 million without electricity. And so uh, groups of people or tribes... Were not, they were aware of this, and they um, their biggest problem was uh, infant mortality. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that we, we, we've certainly got covered much better than they did. And so fertility was important. They needed to have a lot of babies to make up for that. And there would be, you're right, there would be uh, climate change over the long term, and so they would have to move uh, in unexpected events. Um, but they, uh, uh, they survived quite well. We're here and they had a very long, long run, a good long run yeah. and a very stable one. Yeah. You know, and the, the population was pretty stable for a really long time. And they lived into their seventies generally uh, uh, from archeological digs where they found bones. They uh, lived approximately to the same age that we do. And their biggest problem was accidents. Oh, it, it wasn't. All, it wasn't all that different in the say, like eighteen hundred in the U.S. If you were a male who made it to the age of two, you had a really good chance of making it to your seventies. Yeah, where the uh, the lifespan of humans dropped into it dropped into the thirties in the Iron Age and the Bronze Age, because that we were at the nadir of very unhealthful eating and foods and living and disease 
without having the uh, science to, to, to help treat these ills. Plus warfare and uh, accidental death. Then. Sure, but even aside from that, just from, um, just from disease and malnutrition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but the, even then, if you were a male who made it to two, your chances of making it to 70 were pretty good. If you survived infant mortality. If you were a female who survived to two, you had a really good chance of dying giving birth. So there, there was definitely some... You're, you're not wrong about that, <laughs> yeah. But if you look at generally human history from the beginning, 200,000 years ago until now, it went from about the average age, life expectancy was about the 70s, and the Iron Age dropped down to the 30s. That would be absolute bullshit if, 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 you're, if it was... Life expectancy 100,000 years ago is in the 70s, then that's discounting infant mortality. Well, it's hard to know how many babies were born 100,000 years ago. You're right. But so what they have are, are uh, bones to, well, this person lived to this age. And, and uh, so it's a, probably an estimated guess based yeah. on what they found. Because if you discount infant mortality in the Roman Empire and uh, colonial America, the life expectancy goes way up into the 60s and 70s. It, it all comes down to how good are you at keeping people from from dying <laughs> uh, keeping that, babies yes, from dying right that's really the big sure. one there that is the first big hurdle yeah and then uh, the next big one is diseases from uh domesticated animals oh yeah the big plagues yeah almost i mean the majority of the diseases that we are familiar with today come from animals and hunter gatherers didn't have domesticated animals right all right well we are uh out of time, um, where can people find the movie? The Truth About Marriage is, well, the best place is to go to my website, thetruthaboutmarriage.com, and then you can track down the video or the book, DVD, Blu-ray, whatever it is that you prefer. All right. And did you find a big, like, what would you say was the big uh, big conclusion, or is that something uh, people need to watch the movie for? Well, I've had, in the, in the book and the movie, both, I did boil it down. I coalesced it down into a very easy to, to uh, digest handful of, of advice, things that people could do immediately and instantly to improve the trajectory of their relationships. Everybody's doing relationships wrong is what I learned from the experts, some less wrong than others. But I can give you a couple of examples of what you could do and should do. According to, the, to John Gottman, uh, a psychologist, uh, at the Gottman Institute in Seattle, he said that um, a relationship naturally deteriorates over time if you don't put conscious intent into it. It's going to naturally get worse if you don't do a few things, such as express gratitude daily is one thing you could do. Some version of thank you needs to be vocalized, and and you can't do it too often. But people stop doing the mm -hmm. things that they do at the beginning. And so you have to make a conscious effort to do some things. Yeah. Another is listening, especially for the masculine. Men are horrible listeners. The, the right way to listen, the feminine needs this. It's like a relationship vitamin. What she needs, or in the man when he's in his feminine, is for you to come home, put your cell phone uh, on airplane mode, turn off the TV, make eye contact, and for 15 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes, honey, how was your day? Honey, how are, you how are you feeling? How was the day? And then shut up. Don't offer any solutions. Don't ask any, or do, no, don't try to fix anything. It's not a consultation. It's just a, a chance for the feminine to sort of download the emotions that she's experienced during the day. Now, by doing that, if you do, well, it, let me, if you, if you don't do that, she won't feel satisfied and she'll start to get frustrated and that will lead to conflict ultimately and by the same token if the feminine or the woman or who's ever in their feminine shouldn't get greedy and try to take more than the 15 or 20 percent or 20 minutes per night because the male brain can only handle about 15 minutes of emotional talk before what the uh, psychologists call or john gottman calls flooding happen. A male brain will start to flood emotionally after about 15 or 20 minutes. 
a female brain is much more designed for it and can talk about emotions for a much longer period of time. And here's one more thing. I'll, I'll, the counterpoint to that is what the feminine should accept and understand about the masculine. The okay. man or the masculine goes through a cycle. It, both want connection. The feminine wants connection all the time. The masculine also wants connection, but once he has it, he begins to yearn for freedom. He needs to, I got to get away. I need time off. I got to go play golf. You know, John Gray calls it uh, going to the cave. And so if, he, if the, you try to get in the way of that cycle, be, be, uh, the male going between connection and freedom, there's going to be frustration, which will lead to anger and then conflict. So you need to allow him to orbit away because once he has this freedom, He's going to start to miss her and then yearn for connection again and then return. We'll go through this endless cycle of doing so. But the best way to facilitate that is for the masculine one or who was ever in their masculine to say, honey, I'm going to play golf. And when you're announcing this disconnection, also announce when you're planning to reconnect. And I'm so looking forward to seeing you at 730 tonight for dinner when I get home. So now she knows she, she feels secure. And safe, she knows that you're disconnecting, when you're going to reconnect, and you better be home when you said you'd be home, or, or you better call. Those are some of the tips yeah. that uh, are easy. How hard is that to implement? 15 minutes of listening. It's, yeah. you know, it costs you nothing. It's an experiment you can do. Try it for a week and see if things get better. The website, again, is the truthaboutmarriage.com, right? That's correct. For the documentary and the book. All right. Well, Roger, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. We'll have to do it again a little sooner than eight years from now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, better get mo working on that next movie. <laughs> I know. Well, <laughs> I know. I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And if you're looking for the website, be sure to include the word the in the URL because truthaboutmarriage.com is a very different site than thetruthaboutmarriage.com. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, I hope you liked the, the rant at the beginning as well as the, the interview. And uh, yeah, I definitely uh, would appreciate any and all feedback. We will be doing a live stream for patrons uh, for episode 245 and a bigger live stream for everybody episode 250. And so that one's coming up in, in less than two months. Uh, I've been enjoying doing interviews. Uh, I've gotten, heck, I, this is, uh, as of, of uh, release, I have done, man, at this point, I think in nine days' time, I've completed four interviews for the podcast. Yeah, this is going to be fun. I think it'll be a, a nice, healthier uh, change for us. And I do need to, of course, mention that if you want to Support the show, you can find out how at atheistnomads.com slash donate or at patreon.com slash atheistnomads. And if you want to send us a message, you can do so via SpeakPipe with the link on the website or email us, contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a message on the feedback form on the website. Uh, we probably won't be getting to feedback until episode 245. So get it all in before then. They'll give us, uh, send us some questions to talk about for that. Uh, that would be that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, that wraps it up for this week. So until next time, remember, not all those who wander are lost. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.